Hi there, my name is Laird Christensen. I direct the Masters of Science program in Resilient and Sustainable Communities here at Prescott College, and I'm happy to welcome you to this week's Community Re Resilience Workshop. Uh, and we're very excited today to have some folks with us who've been working on uh, developing food systems here on the Prescott College campus. So we have uh, Eleanor Tyson, who is a professor in environmental studies uh, and um, does a, a, a fair amount with the, uh, especially the undergraduate, I, I guess you uh, direct the undergraduate sustainable food systems program, which is a component uh, at this point of the sustainable community development major. And we've also got Brianna Hopple with us, uh, who is, I guess you're gonna become a senior now that we're finishing up this, uh, this year. And uh, Brianna has been really instrumental in helping um, organize students around things like compost pickup, working in the gardens. Uh, she's been working in the Sustainability Center in Cicada Hall. Uh, as well as working as a teaching assistant for uh, Eleanor Tyson's agroecology course right now. So in this time of pandemic and isolation, one of the things that uh, we've been led to realize is our dependence upon distribution systems, food coming from different places. Uh, I think many of us have uh, those of us who have gardens are really excited to be able to create that sense of food security and, and not to be so dependent on these national or international food distribution systems. Um, and so thinking about what we can learn from those about, what we can learn from those uh, opportunities about sustainability, about agriculture and biology, about community organization. There are so many lessons that we can learn from growing food in communities that uh, this seemed like a great opportunity to reflect on uh, the lessons and the incorporation of those lessons into formal education here at Prescott College. So uh, I guess um, I'll put the first question to you, uh, Eleanor, but feel free to jump in, uh, Brianna, whenever you want. And uh, we may have some other students joining us at will, as well to share their experiences. Um, but can you tell us about how the the campus food systems, the gardens, the composting, that sort of thing have been developing so far this year and um, what you're especially excited about. Yeah, so thank you, Lid. That was a great introduction. And um, I'm really excited to be part of um, our Prescott College campus sort of um, rejuvenating their growing spaces and embedding our campus community and wider community more into these places and spaces and just rethinking them. And uh, so I, I arrived here in August and um, found an enthusiastic uh, crew of students that were eager to jump in and start assessing the food system here at the college campus and actually did a block course last fall called Transforming Community Food Systems. And since I was new, we started, you know, right there with what was happening here at the campus. Where was food being grown? Where was it being distributed and consumed? We went to the cafe, we looked at all the garden spaces, we connected with, um, knew there was a campus garden club and um, the students in the course as part of their four weeks took on various aspects of both the campus food system and some actually went into the wider community to explore a model and then suggest transformations moving forward that would be leverage points for building a more resilient and sustainable uh, community, really, um, right here where we're living. And, um, and one subset of the students got particularly interested in our campus composting, which was in need of a little bit of um, reinvigoration. Uh, and um, with the support of the Sustainability Center and those work study students affiliated with that, and then the rebirth of the now uh, garden and compost club. Um, fall 2019 saw a lot of projects really get going that had forethought with how can we actually bring more deeper engagement and make these systems work better, like creating standard operating procedures, give them more student direction. So this kind of more, you know, polycentric governance with these systems. So I just have to tip my hat to students like Brianna who jumped in on this. She was in that block course and um, listened to her classmates' presentations and also had her own input into kind of how do you transform these systems and really took action with some of those original thoughts. I went back and looked at the student presentations from last um, uh, late September to see yeah, what did they recommend we should do. And honestly, 
of everything students were envisioning for the next steps for our college food system, many of these steps have been taken. And then so I can feel now looking back that it's been a very successful year and, and really um, doing um, the kinds of things at that baby step scale that really brings more sustainability to what we can be doing right in uh, our own backyard. So that, that was really the first step was getting a like-minded group of students. There are about 16 students in the class and just getting them reinvested. Part of them really realized this was an opportunity to integrate into their education. So now we have a couple of students designing senior projects around the campus food system and increasing its sustainability. Um, and Brianna can speak about her ideas for that moving forward. And we also had some students um, drafting independent studies. I have one uh, student who may join us a little bit who's doing an independent study this semester on um, educational garden management you know, because she realizes that there's so many urban community and school gardens that are out they're hiring even right now during COVID-19 to get effective leaders to both not just grow food but manage people that want to be in those spaces safely and participate in growing the food as well as how to get everyone on board with learning how to do this in their own um, backyard, so to speak. So whether it's you're composting food waste or you're growing food and you're doing it maybe in your church or your school or your backyard, these needs are even higher now than they have been before. And um, so probably what is the first thing we all decided even as a group in that class is that our campus, we don't actually have a farm right now. Um, in the past, Prescott College has leased and had memos of understanding with actual farmlands you know, you know, a little ways out once in Chino Valley, and then they had some in Skull Valley. But um, of late, I think now we have actually these spaces right here that could be more models of what urban small scale production really is all about, which is kind of the thing now, people realizing we need to grow food everywhere and, and, and anywhere. We don't really need to segregate it into rural spaces. We need to grow food in our towns, neighborhoods, suburban areas, lawns to edible landscapes. All that is really a mark of moving forward with rethinking resiliency and real rethinking how each of us can be more involved in um, you know our own self-sufficiency as well as supporting those around us so we have this gold mine of at least three garden spaces on campus that um, one of which was cultivated through last summer and the other has been fairly neglected that the fall group of students said let's you know let's revive those let's revive the club let's get the compost functioning um, I'm going to actually ask Brianna to tell the story of the composting system because that's really gone through quite a journey since last uh, October and, um, and even the story continues to now. Yeah, um, the composting system, we got here um, and there wasn't really a set of people to be turning the compost other than the one to two garden position workers um, that were also left to manage three gardens throughout the school year, um, at least three gardens, like Eleanor said. Um, and so we looked at trying to find a labor force for this because it's such an essential, essential part to sustainability, um, environmentally and socially based on impacts. Um, economically to putting your nutrients back into your soil, obviously. Um, so compost is very integrated into just the basic concepts of sustainability. Um, and we thought what better way to have this, have a labor force um, than to have paid workers um, contribute some sort of labor to the compost system, whether that's turning or we developed a pickup system last fall too, um, which I can talk about. Um, so we look towards the sustainability lounge because as I said, compost being sustainable just lends to the tasks of people who are um, initiating sustainable um, development on campus. So we had 10 work study students in the sustainability lounge and out of the 10, six, um, so that they were interested in doing compost uh, centered and garden centered um, tasks for their work study hours. So that's where we kind of got um, a big labor force for picking up compost, turning the compost. And then we also had classes um, that contributed to doing uh, to compost turnings and compost pickups too. So looking at the intersectionality of like all of these bodies working together um, is representing social sustainability in this community, taking care of this essential part um, to their development on campus, I think was 
one of the biggest accomplishments that we achieved in the fall. I think got a lot more people aware about it and um, kind of put it at the forefront of their mind, um, which was awesome. I know that um, I think the transforming community food systems turned the compost at least once, if not twice. Um, and uh, I think that Eleanor Soils class also was turning the compost fairly regularly um, last semester. So those are just like a couple of examples of like educational classes that were in the compost and in the garden spaces. Um, and that was, that was like the, the development of workforce for the compost, which was awesome. And then we also had um, outside community members come in. So I organized with North Point School um, and they had a class that was actually dedicated. It was like a block class dedicated to sustainability. Um, and the person who was the teacher for that class was also a Prescott College alumni, which was awesome. Um, so connections through that was pretty cool. Um, and then the development of compost system in the fall, I think was amazing how we got it all under control. Um, and then uh, we were talking with all of our administration um, and our faculty and staff about their inputs on the compost system, what, like, what they are looking forward to, further development. Um, and then that's kind of how we got our own, um, or we got the idea to move the compost system, which was the biggest development in the spring. Um, and that was, that was really inspirational and we finally did it. And we can talk about that a little more later too. Um, but yeah, anything else that you want me to talk about for the fall of the compost system? I just wanted to uh, point out what then Brianna's story that uh, was so striking to me is that you really see the potential of these kinds of functioning demonstration activities and spaces, ways that here, here right on our campus we can walk the talk and live in the way we're aspiring to with the way we're educating around sustainability principles, trying to be more agroecological, trying to kind of cycle back the system. In fact, and through one of those conversations that Brianna was interviewing others and I also had some conversations about our existing system, I realized a lot of our staff and faculty didn't even realize we were putting the compost, spreading it back into the gardens. So um, Brianna mentioned the soils class, they not only did a lab with compost and assessing it, they then spent part of the class lab um, actually putting it into the terrace garden and um, then seeding a cover crop as well as putting some more organic matter and leaves into the garden space is that they had assessed the terrace garden a few weeks before that and during another lab and concluded that one of the challenges of the soils and there was that it needed more organic matter. So I think what's interesting is that although we were doing all these things, we realized the perception because no one's looking over our shoulders if we do all this, they weren't understanding how intrinsically important it was to the learning in a certain classroom setting, but also how this was how we're setting the stage for what's coming now this spring and getting the gardens productive. We had to do a lot of effort in the fall, both in spreading that, that cured compost and involving students in that, as well as outside um, folks coming in, such as the North Point Academy high schoolers. Um, it's a real opportunity to kind of, you know, basically close the loop and keep the nutrient cycling right here on our campus. And also I'll point out, um, Rihanna and her other work studies did reach out to the cafe and succeed in getting them to agree to cooperate with composting. The probably the most um, breakthrough step that these work study students decided on their own to do is set up a col that collection system because offering to come and collect the food waste really makes a difference whether you're an office worker in the one stop or you're a student living in the village or you're the cafe so they actually decorated these buckets and set up a pickup schedule and came in person to pick up the buckets and i think having that dedicated work study labor force as brianna mentioned not just volunteers but actually ones who can regularly and routinely you know maintain and manage these systems is super critical because no one's going to be willing to let food sit rotting outside their dorm door unless they know someone's coming to get it and um, perhaps actually the biggest challenge has been that we we're trying to shift the compost from being so uh, more of a self-serve system to being a more managed system because we have had real quality control issues as we spread the cured compost in the fall we noticed there's a lot of micro trash um, twist ties um, fruit and vegetable stickers plastic lids, plastic spoons, 
not sure how and where that gets in there. And of course, you can um, you can uh, actually kind of filter it out, but it does add to the quality declination decline of the of the com cured compost. So we've had more success when our work study folks can actually do a little visual inspection. Some people tend to want to dump things that are whole whole foods, you know, like a whole head of romaine lettuce, where many of you may understand that for composting to work more rapidly and successfully, getting everything in small bits and pieces. So uh, Brianna's crew, they actually created a sign that was the do's and don'ts of composting. And number one was do chop everything up as finely as possible. Do make sure you're adding layers of brown. Many people who are self-serve dumping into the existing composting system we're just dumping and not actually adding that layer of brown. So I think we've realized moving that, that system away from where everyone could just wander in, pull up and dump was actually a great first step to kind of assuming more quality control and better management practices. And I think that's really, we were just starting to make that transition, but it's, it's been a little bit of an adjustment because um, we did officially close the upper level existing compost system. It's the structure is still there. We're going to be converting the structure into uh, with a roof into storage and um, a space to keep tools and other kind of things we need for our production system. But uh, there have been many people pulling up as I turn that last pile. Going, Wait, where can I take my compost? I've been dumping compost here for years, and I'm like, oh, who are you? <laughs> and it's like, oh, I live in Prescott, you know. So we, I think we've gotten a reputation for being a place to bring any of your food waste, but it really was getting a little beyond our capacity. So we're trying to now exert a little bit more. Um, control over the process, as well as planning to do more education and outreach to help those people who might not be able to come bring their food waste as much anymore, um, that aren't necessarily part of our campus community, help them actually transition to composting on their own. So we see our, our effort not just being in managing these systems, but a big E education. I mean, we really are an educational campus. This is our mission, not only for our own students, but for our wider world. So this is a super opportunity to be leaders and educators, both as faculty, staff, and students around these kinds of projects. I think we've done a lot on education around garden, garden spaces. I was also thinking back to the, the do's and don'ts poster, the constant announcement when we're doing pickups. Um, we've put some reminders on compost pickups posters, like please take off your stickers or something like that. Um, we've used, um, like a barcode scan that goes to the do's and don'ts um, before uh, we conducted a compost video. Uh, we did that all in the fall um, and it kind of was an introduction to our system and how to compost and why we should compost. Um, so yeah, I think that we've done a lot with education, but I think that there's definitely a lot more to do for sure. Um, and I think with on an, on the note of the capacity of our system being full, I seeing the difference of food waste being produced when we were picking up in the fall to seeing like it in the spring because we got the compost video out towards the end of the semester. We started the pickup system towards the end of the semester and there's just been like an increase in compost, I think. And I know that I added around like four additional buckets to houses that didn't have compost buckets um so that was um more capacity more more food waste going in um so yeah and that, Brianna, you, should, you should mention too that you made um create a buckets for off-campus students to actually be able to compost in the apartments and houses they rent so that they could actually participate in the on-campus composting. So really a next step, and this is what I'm hoping Brianna will move towards with her senior project, is sort of assessing, you know, actually measuring, weighing, how much quantity are we getting from exclusively on-campus and off-campus students? How much maybe are we getting from campus offices and the cafe? Um, and then also maybe reaching out and getting in touch with some of these non-campus community connected users um, and understanding what that amount and capacity. We probably will have to create a second um, new system that might be in a different location um, because I think having it in smaller uh, quantity, it's another three bin system, uh, makes it more manageable for a crew, a small crew of students. We don't have, we're not doing a mechanized system. We're not using bucket loaders and 
you know, we're, we're manually turning it. So the bigger and larger a pile gets, the more daunting it can be for one or two people to turn. And the more um, exposure you have to sometimes, you know, problem. I had a student working with turning compost who had asthma and she has some difficulty breathing. So I don't want to make it a, a treacherous and arduous and painful experience to work with the compost. It can actually be kind of fun. And, um, you know, uh, we, we were turning compost and discovered lots of critters, a uh, little mouse popped its head up and um, a garter snake. And it was it's kind of fun. And, um, but we want to make sure it's not this gargantuan task. So splitting it into smaller systems and getting a better handle on what we do have the capacity to do and then how we actually welcome people into composting, but maybe not necessarily doing it right on the Prescott campus all the time. We'd love to see more backyard composting, composting at schools, restaurants. Evidently restaurants have been using our compost. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the farmers market's been using our compost. You know, it's like it's become the main place to bring food waste um, in the Prescott urban area. So I think that's been a real learning curve for some of us newcomers that it's it's well known, but it's kind of like a real like drop it and run kind of mentality. And we want to go from that to more interactive. Like we've even talked about the idea of community supported composting, where if you want to participate, then you either can donate hours and time to turning or potentially donate some money to help us support the equipment and, and management and, and um, actual labor needs. You know, this is uh, this is so great. And I've got a whole page of questions already that I'd love to ask. But I know, Eleanor, you had some images from the garden to share. And I'm thinking that for people who aren't on campus right now, it would be great for them to have in their minds some visual uh, images of that gardening so that as we go on and talk about this, we'll be able to make those connections. Would you be willing yeah. to I'd love to. Um, Carla just needs to enable me to screen share. She, uh, the, the screen sharing is disabled, yes. but you can do that, do that. for me, Carla. Thank you so much. I'll do that right now. Yeah, and, um, and uh, Brianna, maybe mention also that you created an Instagram. Oh yeah, we have the Prescott Garden and Compost Instagram. Um, it's pc underscore garden dot compost. If anybody wants to follow it when they're listening to this recording or right now, um, and we've just been posting pickups in the gardens. We've also posted like reminders on there, like no stickers, cut up your foods. Um, so kind of using it as an educational tool for how to maintain these systems and how they're being maintained, but also um, educational in the way to, or just a sense of connectedness still to spaces, especially in these times. But overall, the people who are off campus aren't getting into the gardens as often as people who are on campus. Um, so maintaining connections, um, very yeah. important. And I, I realized, we've all realized that during this semester, as we switch gears, little less doing going on with the compass we've maintained that that project but we started some new projects and we realized that the biggest challenge has been co maintaining community and communication and even though we're in this era of so many ways to communicate everything from zoom to instagram you know emails phone calls it's still really hard to create and cultivate that sense of place that i think many students were starting to feel that ownership and sense of place by being involved in these projects right on the campus so um, I tasked my TAs for the agroecology class, which include Brianna, um, uh, uh, also uh, student Shelly Willette and Matt Badness. And then a fourth TA joined in toward the second half of the semester as she crafted an independent study on garden management named Casey Griffin, who may join us. Um, these actual um, TAs, I actually said, work with my uh, 16 agroecology students, half of which went remote, went home, and the other half stayed here to actually maintain them in committees to kind of make decisions as we move forth, forward in the second half of the spring semester with actually making some of these visions of um, these projects come to life. Because we spent the first half of spring semester for, and in this case, it was actually a course that took on the gardens as a major aspect of um, how we wanted to apply our knowledge, as well as the composting system. The class is called agroecology. And it had a great mix of students from all programs. I have students in it who are psychology that were interested in gardening for ecotherapy. We had students um, that were also more politically motivated from the cultural regional studies that were looking at community organizing as well as environmental studies students. We had a real mix. Some were first year, some were seniors. Um, all, all, some had had classes with me before, some had never even tried doing agroecology. But we started out in the beginning of the semester in person and took on as our projects these three spaces that, um, you know, McClintock Garden, if you're familiar with the campus, is closer to the student housing in the village. 
And um, Terrace Garden is up near um, where the current composting, the older composting system is located and kind of in the front of campus. And Cafe Garden is a really teeny little space that's back behind the cafe, kind of as it turns back into a street near the dumpsters, but it's this, this little fenced area that Formerly, it was really more of an herb garden, which has gotten a little overgrown, but we were thinking, why don't we think we think that? So although this class was not an ECOSA design class, we actually started out in the class doing some designing and talking about how do we approach these spaces. And a big piece of the design process was the class got into three groups, each got to choose which garden they wanted to work on designing, although that wasn't committing them to staying in that space as a workspace, but we wanted to at least get people to kind of present to each other. And that team, each team was led by a TA and they did work in the sites and measured it and mapped it and then had discussion. They all had to come up with mission statements that reflected our college mission. And so they had to be at least educational in some capacity, but they each had, were given the freedom to rethink these spaces. Should there be spaces to produce food to sell or to go take into the cafe? Should these be spaces for students to get more access to nutritional foods or medicines? Or should these be therapeutic, recreational, social spaces? I mean, there's a lot of potential uses of spaces like these. They don't necessarily have to be market gardens where we're growing to sell at a market. They really, we have a lot of different interests and in ways students want to learn at this college. So we want to reflect the different, you know, thinking of these spaces as learning laboratories, as a place where you can experiment or bring to life your vision around, you know, um, whether it's social sustainability or if you're trying to understand more about agroecological relationships. We did all agree that we were going to try to imp imp reflect and demonstrate agroecological principles as much as possible. And we use the FAO's 10 elements of agroecology as our guiding, uh, guiding frame post, which actually is more than just the ag agronomy part of growing things, but also looks at the social and political context, uh, how things like, you know, polycentric governance and circular economies are part of agroecology. So we really try to think through all those elements. And so they all did a great job. They presented to each other. They did feedback on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. We were at that phase where we kind of settled in the, the takeaways and what everyone was agreeing to move forward with as feasible and doable for the plans that people had designed that we were gonna start in on after break. And then of course, coronavirus pandemic changed our plans. Uh, when everyone that didn't go home, that remained on campus, um, we pick up the pieces again. We were resuming our class as a Zoom meetings twice a week, but the folks who were about half the students were still resident around here or on campus. Um, they actually agreed to keep going with the plans on our Thursday work days. So we took the redesigns and um, the photo is actually of the McClintock space, which some of the folks seeing this might recognize, but um, we actually maintained a couple of rows in the middle, which had been planted by Gabe Kerbs, who's a Prescott College uh, affiliate. He's no longer a student, but he cared for the garden all last summer and he actually had planted garlic last fall. So his garlic's actually visible in the photo, but the student, um, Olivia Stokes, is actually in there helping form the new beds. We decided to go with um, a different kind of more, um, uh, let's see, polycultural friendly format versus long rows. Since we're not doing market production with one crop, we wanted to have beds that actually welcome people to be in the garden more, that they could stand around. You could have groups kneeling around and weeding. And in each bed, there's going to be at least two to three different varieties or types of um, interplanted crop species that are hopefully complementary. Um, so uh, we were shaping these beds in the photo that was taken here. This is from um, about a few weeks ago. And we actually dismantled the old greenhouse that formerly been damaged um, uh, over a year ago in a past winter storm. And where you can kind of see in the very corner of the picture, a little piece of the old greenhouse, that's where we actually now have rebuilt the new composting site. So this garden now hosts the new composting site, three bay bins, and also is where we've reshaped the beds a little bit to orient them to be more polycultural versus monocultural, again, to reflect these agroecological principles. And um, the uh, McClintock's now actually the one garden that has been planted to some degree. We now have some plants, some starts in each of the beds. We had um, also direct seeded a little bit and we're putting wood chips in the pathways and we've put it more seeding in the garden because the idea behind this was to make it more of a social space, a space, oops, a space that um, people could share. So this is the other project that uh, we actually started right after spring break. The three uh, students are trying to be socially distant in this photo. So this is under COVID-19 restrictions. We um, These students also live together in the village. So I think they think of themselves as a family, but we were um, in this, uh, this is part of Cicada Hall, which is the sustainability center where we have a set, two sets of grow lights where we can put uh, many flats on these racks 
under fluorescent lights. And that let us get started with some of our seed starting in March. So what the students are doing now is they're actually seeding heirloom varieties of tomatoes and peppers that we won a grant from the Native American Seed Search, uh, uh, the Native Seed Search Company in Tucson gave us a seed grant and we were selected, we selected many varieties adapted to this part of, this, of Southwest and connected and affiliated with native groups of this region and um, potentially really mostly tomatoes, hot peppers, beans, and squash. We already at Prescott have a seed collection with a lot of native corn varieties, so we didn't feel like we needed to get more of those. But right now the students were getting a head start on the tomatoes and they did sprout and now we ended up with so many tomatoes. We have hundreds. Um, uh, one variety is actually called the Prescott heirloom, which has grape tomatoes, which are little small tomatoes. And we have so many of those with um, the eye toward um, a fall course, which is called the Art and Science of Food Preserving. It's gonna be doing more seed saving with these varieties. And another student has designed her senior project around some of these um, Native American varieties. And she was here, she's in the photo, Olivia at the very back of the photo, she's actually um, uh, was there to seed and actually transplant some of these. Um, she's actually leaving tomorrow and I'm giving her a few tomatoes to take back to Kentucky with her, but she plans to be back in the fall and be part of seed saving as a teaching assistant in the um, food preservation class. So we did the seed starting. We're actually continuing now with starting to transplant some of these as well as direct seeding more things in the garden. And um, that's been a big project. And this is a photo of the new composting system, Matt Fadness, one of the other TAs. So this student, this system was designed um, with lots of kind of collaborative discussion, searching online. Um, and then um, uh, Shelly Ouellette, our other TA, had a friend who donated all this scrap lumber. And we have a lot of materials in the contact that we're trying to repurpose, reuse, recycle. So we're trying to do this with purchasing as little new materials as possible. So um, Matt's here doing some carpentry and the system that was like midway through, the system now has actually had its first few dumps of food waste from the village as well as from a few other donors and we're layering it in browns. And then the last photo I wanted to share is, um, is this is just the terrace garden, which Brianna has been in charge of. So each TA, um, then also became managers of these spaces and now has led the work days in these spaces. So they just finished their last rounds of work days. Um, they did them in, they, we call them sunset work sessions because it has started to get hot. And we found that the Thursday late morning and late early afternoon just got too unbearable. And what they've been doing, they had, uh, Brianna, you can tell them about your work session, but they are all presenting the um, results and updates on all these work sessions to the rest of the class um, through Zoom on in tomorrow's final class in a way to help those students as they, final, they finally reflect and do their signature assignment around integrating the theory and practice. So even the students who ended up doing more uh, projects remotely back in their home states are still able to reflect and talk about what we've progressed with in this space. Did you wanna talk about Terrace a little bit, Brianna? You're muted. Thank you. <laughs> um, so we're trying to have a collection of um, Native American crops in Terrace Garden and have that as like an educational space with signs um, and kind of demonstrating plants that are very adapted for growing in this region. Um, and so to get started, we had to prep everything. So we're actually going to incorporate chickens into the terrace garden, um, which is a very, very exciting thing. Um, and they'll go, if you're familiar with the terrace garden, they'll go um, behind the compost system where you can see along the fence. And then they'll have on the first terrace down, um, there'll be beds and we have a path going down there and nice seating. Um, so if you ever want to go into the terrace garden and um, chill out, it's really, it's really nice there. Um, and then we have a path going down and then you'll be able to see the chickens. Um, so we started digging that path. Um, we also have a path that goes down the second terrace, which is what Matt is doing in that picture. Um, and we have wood chips fully in there. Um, the first terrace path is halfway done. And then we have all three terraces weeded um, now. So they're ready to be prepped. Um, the compost that was actually spread by a work study student uh, this spring was spread out thinner. Um, so then we can add more compost to the other layers. 
um, incorporate more of that organic matter that Eleanor was talking about, the soils classing, class assessing. Um, and yeah, we're gonna do some three sister squash um, mounds at the bottom terrace, a um, lot of tomatoes and peppers. Like Eleanor said, we have a lot of those. Um, and we actually have waffle beds in this garden, which is, um, yeah, Eleanor's pointing them out. Um, they are kind of dipped in beds uh, with higher, higher ends, and then the water is collected down where the plants are. Um, this is very popular to do in arid regions where you're trying to collect water for your plants. Um, and then this, the bottom, in that, in like the left side of the picture, we're planning to do a huga culture, which is also another um, educational development <laughs> in this garden. And that's actually where you bury a bunch of carbon, um, in other words, wood, uh, and it's decomposing into the soil. And we are planning to do um, some berry bushes or potentially a potato patch. Um, in that and a student from the agroecology class is actually leading that. So we have, although I, I am, I've taken a lot of like leadership in designing this space, um, there's still a lot of things incorporated from students in these spaces um, and communally contributing to ideas. Um, like I mentioned earlier that there's going to be chickens in this garden, but we actually have um, five dedicated students along with myself who have been researching into chicken maintenance, um, available materials for us, bedding, um, and stuff like that. So we have a lot of students who, it takes a, it takes a whole army to, to get some of these gardens revitalized and, and prepped for the season. So I think that it's amazing that we have such a dedicated community to um, and it's really inspiring to see a lot of my fellow peers around me um, and everybody that showed up to my ter the Terrace Garden work day was very powerful and very moving. <laughs> and, I, and I just wanted to point out that in the, having cultivating teaching assistants to be leaders or even students doing independent studies um, is really the secret behind actually bringing more resilience to these systems and in, in, in terms of our social capacity because as a faculty member, I can't manage these systems by myself. We don't have a full-time faculty garden manager or staff person, but these students have so much ability and capacity, in particular some of our accelerated master's students like Brianna and Shelly, that I feel like they're our real natural born leaders to actually get students involved and help guide them through how they can be involved and educate them and, and, and provide that leadership. So I love um, having more, giving them more autonomy and letting them do this um, and uh, the work nights that they organized were kind of their final exam and I was not only looking for how what they accomplished but how well they interacted with their peers and actually set up potential activities for those peers to do and actually educated while they were doing these tasks so it's not just about going out there and sweating hard but actually learning how do you hold a hoe how do you why are we doing hugel culture what is the role of animals in the agro ecosystem? Why, why would we bring chickens into this system? Is, you know, what, is it just for their eggs? And what if you're a vegetarian or vegan? So having those conversations informally, as well as following up on what they're reading in their textbooks and hearing, um, looking at other content is really a, a super way to get to do experiential ed, but also I feel builds a stronger campus food system because that way, even if you're not going to do a competence or degree in these things, you're still having some engagement with what all of us rely on, which is our food system. All of us ultimately must figure out where we're having the food we eat and do it with the least damage and the most benefit to our natural environment. And what better space to start than right here on our beautiful campus. And we're, all, we're also, Matt, who's not here today, is also kind of in charge of figuring out some water management and not only doing irrigation, but looking at these traditional practices of being conserving, conservative about water use, such as the waffle beds, uh, oleas, which are buried pots. We're thinking of integrating these as well so that we're not drawing down the water table as much. We're being very conserving and modeling arid agricultural adaptations, which again, this garden with the crop varietal mix is sort of trying to kind of bring in those varieties that will adapt well to this area. And of course, represent not just 
biodiversity with different crops, but within the crops, varietal diversity, which is something that's really being challenged right now globally. Um, we're in a world of monoculture, genetically modified uh, crops. Um, we're losing a lot of our um, indigenous varietal diversity that when humans used to actually create more diversity in the world, the first farmers were actually generating more. And now we're in this model of growing at the larger scale where we just we wipe away the diversity. So we're trying to go look at the smaller scale, the urban scale, the home garden scale. And, um, and I don't have a photo of the cafe garden yet, but that was the work group last night and it's kind of a tiny garden. And the group working there is really thinking more about healing and therapy. They have uh, suggested calling that the resilience garden that they want to also rename some of these spaces and rethink the, the mission statements of each one. So that's one of the pro projects that they're kind of um, working with now is the signage, the publicity, how we actually educate about these directly and indirectly. Um, and I'll, I'll stop sharing slides, but I just wanted to show one last, which is looking forward to fall 2020. Yes, at Prescott, we are planning for face-to-face -face classes and we really are excited and um, right now, literally, we're putting the seeds in the ground that we're going to have ho hopefully bear the fruits of in the fall with students directly engaging with the, the harvest. There is no uh, soils or agroecology class in the fall, but there is a class called Art and Science of Food Preservation. Um, in that course, I'm using a similar model of recruiting student leaders to be TAs who we're going to take on different aspects of preserving. And in uh, one in particular is going to be doing seed saving. So we'll be in the garden actually saving the seed savable varieties. But we'll also be talking about how you take these products and you can transform them to foods um, through fermentation, through dehydration, freezing, all the different ways you can preserve and connecting it to cultural traditions where these preserved foods are so much a part of different um, nutrition regimes as well as cuisines, things like sauerkrauts and kimchi, which is fermented vegetables, to, to yogurts and things like that where you're using herbs to flavor them or even cheeses and also looking at um, how you can build sustainable food all the way from sea to table. So we're trying to kind of bring opportunities for students to interact with the food system at all these dimensions, whether it's learning about soil quality, learning about how to bring soil quality up through composting or how to uh, preserve food or act, grow food and, and all this we're hoping gets back into the bellies of all our students. So this is a photo from the last fall's block course that Brianna was in. There she is standing here holding her plate and we culminated that transforming community food systems class with a great uh, student meal where we all cook foods that represented, I think it was a meal we did our cultural traditions and um, and we also did some cooking together and we didn't have a lot to harvest from the garden then but this fall, when we do more student meals along those lines, I think we're going to be able to host some great social, um, hopefully, maybe they'll be small, less, 10 or less, but some great social experiences for students that let them directly have access to some of the bounty of these gardens completely free, because we're trying to make sure these foods are very accessible, especially to students. So I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Eleanor. Uh, this has been great. Um, we, we're coming up to uh, almost an hour, and that's usually our target for closing. I said that I have lots of questions, but I think I'd rather open that space for any questions or comments that anyone else may have. And if, if nobody's got anything to say, I'll, I'll certainly jump in, but uh, let's just open it up for a minute and, and see if anyone else does have a question or a comment. Okay. I'm seeing some shaking of heads, um, so that's okay. Um, you know, you made a comment early on, actually, I'm not sure if it was you or Brianna, but talking about the, the current separation of areas for growing food from the areas that we live, which is obviously an industrial model of food production. And uh, when we think about reintegrating food production into our living areas, uh, that led me to wonder about, is there a capacity here, considering the weather, considering the soil, considering the space that we have, to actually grow enough food that it could be incorporated into how students eat on campus, whether through the cafe or through making CSA sort of boxes available to students. Are there any plans for that kind of integration? Brianna, you wanna try for that answer? Um, I think that we have looked at the model. There is a 
refrigerator in the sustainability lounge where we've thought had like a couple ideas going around with utilizing that whether that's gleaning from the prescott farmers market um from like farmers who don't want to take uh, some pro produce home with them um and then we can offer it at a like for free for students um we've talked about doing like discounted veggie sales in the refrigerator um so not really what you would be paying for at a farm stand but a little bit of money to go back into the resource funds for the gardens. Um, so that's kind of what we've been thinking about. Uh, but right now, especially with a lot of COVID um, effects of just uh, losing jobs or financial implications, uh, there's, there's a really big need for food security. And I think that that's our main mission right now is increasing food security for a lot of students. And there's a decent amount of students who are staying on campus over the summer. A lot of our crops will be ready in the, in the fall. So if we do plan to have um, in-person classes and that does work out, then we will have food for um, students who are coming back. Um, so just available for students, I think is our mission right now but for further development in the future, especially with growing the program, we, we are looking into um, potential. And there's, there's also other garden spaces too, other than the three that we're talking about and um, more potential to utilize those spaces to increase um, our wealth of vegetables and fruits. <laughs> Yeah, that was spot on, Brianna. Yeah, I'll say that since as someone who's new to the area, I really needed a good solid full seasonal year round to understand what it's like growing food here and the capacity and also to meet farmers and growers and network with the other folks in our, our kind of contextual food system. And I'm learning a lot from those folks. And for example, the Prescott Farmers Market does go year round and there are growers, particularly in the valleys that do generate produce year round, microgreens and eggs and things like that. And there's, you can do some season extension. It does get quite cold because of elevation. So it's not as you know easy to grow year round as it might be in the, de in the lower desert. But um, for example, the market with COVID-19, they have managed to keep the market open with an online ordering process. So you can go on between today and to, between Tuesday and Thursday to actually put an order in. And then you go drive to the Yavapai College parking lot and pick up your produce. They give you a box. So they've kind of changed to this kind of order online pick up, which actually might be more convenient for some and, and maybe not as fun to wander around. But um, one of the TAs presented to our agroecology class about this who's volunteering every Saturday and it was really interesting to think about well maybe that's a model we'd go forward with is an online ordering and maybe we do box deliveries. Um, I, the cafe piece because they're institutional and they have certain needs in terms of quantity and quality and price point that has really been a, a challenging you talk to any campus farm or garden and, and unless the garden or farm is owned by the food service um, contract company and actually with their workers paid. Um, it's really been tricky to make it work economically to have those these kinds of farm to take farm to school um, supply chains really work at large large institutions and even Prescott's got enough people to feed at their cafe and a limited enough menu where they just need a lot of us like a lot of avocados you know they don't really need to get all kinds of different things from us but I don't exclude the opportunity to educate and have like sampling at the cafe or have a special night when the regular grills close and have a special dinner in there we did a Thanksgiving dinner last fall when the cafe was technically closed and used all their facilities and cooked up food ourselves I think I'm emphasizing more with the food we're creating now that this should be for educational purposes as well as food access and nutrition so people that need it can get it. But as Brianna mentioned, long term planning down the road, like five year plan, I would love to see the capacity grow. And there are different sites that we have minimums of understanding with that could potentially host a Prescott College farm rebirth where an entire farm operation set up that does have the capacity to maybe get into more of an institutional sales setup where there may be at the markets uh, or, or doing a CSA. I mean, it, uh, it's unbelievable, how, you know, you can grow a lot of food on a very small amount of space, but when you start recruiting even 30 to 40 CSA members, they have really broad desires and tastes and needs. So to be able to grow that diversity and in the quantity and in succession, would take a full-time farm manager and a full-time student staff in the summer of four or five folks, and even a staff of students um, working through the year. And so it really does, it's possible 
And we even were looking toward the possibility of this APS property that may or may not become part of Prescott across the street, becoming an urban farm. So the capacity could grow and be there, but it really would, I think, need to be married closely with students' educational goals and needs and um, be supported by, you know, it couldn't necessarily be self-supporting, it'd have to be subsidized at some level by the institution. So the college would need to recognize that as an important part of the campus food security. But I will say now, there's actually also farmers out there that we have affiliations with that have our graduates working at them. Um, Whipstone Farm here in Prescott is, is a notable um, example that sells to local restaurants, is, a, is an anchor tenant at the farmer's market. And you know I think they would be a great farm to actually get more of their produce in our cafe. I'd rather see us um, in our sales of food bringing more food from our established local farms that really have it going as a business. Since whatever we do here on campus really would not just be purely a business model, it'd be more of that educational model, making sure people can come into these spaces, interact with plants and animals, touch, tell, you know, touch, taste, smell, and, and all ages. So we can bring high school groups in, kids groups in, um, and just sort of demonstrate and educate, more of like a, what you think of a botanical garden. I think we need to recognize we have an important role to play to make sure Everyone around here knows what it looks like when, you know, what a plant looks like that you ultimately then eat the fruit of and, and or can see that process. And we, we, we've got some close ties with some of the seven school gardens that are in the region. Um, we were gonna host, um, Brianna was instrumental. She also is the representative on Slow Food Prescott along with Maddie Wheeler. And they were gonna actually bring on the Slow Food Prescott event in early April. What was that gonna be called? That was gonna be on campus? It was gonna be the Slow Food Exposition. So it's kind of like a what is Slow Foods introduction for the campus. So I think we, we can play a big role in hosting groups like that's events and getting more of the broader public going, wow, Prescott College, they really are a place to go to learn about sustainability, learn about, learn about growing my own food. I mean, yes, you can go to the Yavapai County Extension Service and get a list of crop planting dates, but we want to try to have that information that People really are asking right now, like, what, what should I grow if I grow food in my backyard? Can I grow dry beans? What's that like? And what variety should I grow? And what about my soil? Is it contaminated? How can I build my own soil? And I think there's a huge need in every neighborhood, every backyard, every community from all ages of people that want to really learn this now. It's not just our college students. So I see our students as being the leaders in this. And whether they're grad students or undergrads, that they are really going to be the ambassadors and that's why I'm spending a lot of time making sure they have the tools to be educators themselves. Because even if you're gonna be a farmer, you gotta, if you're doing it in an alternative way like this and, and really integrating agroecological principles and sustainability, you gotta know how to talk about it, promote it, put it out there on you know, the internet. You gotta learn how to like face-to-face -face sell it. So really having our students learn to be better um, in educators with adults and people around them is critical because you're not gonna sell what we're doing unless you know how to talk about it. So um, yeah, Brianna just did a presentation to the class about animals in the agroecosystem. And it was, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of variables to consider. Chickens aren't there just to provide eggs. They're there to actually do a lot of ecosystem services, everything from insect control to manure and food waste, and also the scale matters and the care of them. And then even just that engagement with animals. You did a great job, by the way, Brianna. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to add one thing about the cafe. Um, when the slow food representative Molly Beverly uh, was working as the cafe director, she did um, incorporate a lot of the things from the garden into the cafe. Um, and we're looking at how to do that. Um, and there's specials every day at the cafe. So we definitely could incorporate um, specials into our gardens in that way. So. Yeah, yeah, there's potential. And I think we've learned a lot from Molly Beverly. She's a great resource. Her big, um, I think she was the, one of the first managers of the cafe when it first opened. And um, I think the scale of the number of people eating there now is sort of exploded a little bit more and once you go beyond a certain scale, but there's great, um, Sunny is very cooperative about us hosting um, like learning opportunities in the kitchens when they're closed. And I think he'd be receptive um, you know, even things like if we, we're growing sunflowers, especially some edible flowers, including like sunflower seeds. Um, so I think having edible bouquets would be really fun to have on offer the during orientation or the first week of classes in the semester. 
Um, we've got lots of little ideas of just how to kind of brighten everyone's lives a little bit and also get them tasting things they may never ever thought of eating, like nibbling a nasturtium or, you know, making a fun mixed green salad, you know, and um, I, I also am a co-director of the core curriculum and I've, I have all these great ideas for getting core one, the first semester students, as well as even going down the line, um, get them all having an experience with composting in the garden, because I think that's a great way to get them connected to this place, whether they live on campus or off, or they've been online and they came here to be residential. I'd love to get the grad students when they're here for residencies involved in the gardens and composting. And so thinking about all those potential activities, that's where I want some of the food to go is because when you host an activity and you're like, hey, we're going to make salsa together. And then you go, but wait, everyone give me 10 bucks first. I, it's sort of a killer, you know, to do that. So I really like the idea of being able to have this fruit in our gardens that I can go, everyone, let's go get some tomatoes. We're going to make a big salsa. This is how you do it. And then go, now you get to take it with you. So that's how I like to feed people. It's like get them together, um, you know, getting the food, prepping it and making it. And then they get the free food and they sort of earn it by learning. And um, I think that's one way we've kind of talked about distribution at this small, small scale. But to answer your question, Larry, I think there is capacity down the line. And my, my long-term plan is to see that grow. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. Um, I do want to uh, just mention for those of you who are on uh, watching this now, if you want to receive a transcript uh, or get a link to the video that's going on, if you just, uh, write your email address into the chat, then Carla can, um, can make sure that gets to you. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to mention, and really this is a, an opportunity, is I heard you talk about uh, helping people learn to do their own composting and that sort of thing. Um, as, as some of you know, we have uh, an AmeriCorps volunteer that will be coming to work in the Sustainability Center this fall, and a part of the AmeriCorps uh, set up is there has to be some kind of service component to the community, uh, in particular to uh, low, lower income uh, families in the community. And it occurs to me that the kind of education that you're talking about, whether it's, you know, what can you grow in your yards? What kind of edibles can you grow in your yards? The schoolyard gardens that you talked about, um, what is a very low cost version of a compost to create? And obviously, you know, you can just uh, do a loop of chicken wire and, and do your compost that way. Um, that this would be a great opportunity to figure out how um, your classes, Eleanor, or the work that Brianna, you're doing through the Sustainability Center can, uh, can mesh uh, with that outreach requirement of the uh, AmeriCorps position. Um, so it feels like we've come so far and I'm really glad I saw the session today because it really made me realize how much work has been done so far uh, in, in one year and I'm, I'm really grateful to y'all for doing that um, and that there are multiple directions to, to keep going from here. But I'm very excited to go down and visit with the gardens over the summer and, and uh, help with the gardens. We don't have a garden here in my family anymore after you know, 20 years of having a beautiful garden where we came from. Uh, we just don't have the, the land that we're living on here to do it. So I'd love to be, be a part of that. Bring the whole family. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's actually families working in garden spaces together is one way to do the social distancing. And actually some of our school garden, um, uh, the elementary school garden leaders said that's what they're thinking of moving towards as some of the restrictions lift, but people are very cautious about being social groups saying, hey, sign up and do a family hour and come with just you, you and your family to work. And that gives you a little direction and guidance. And then you get to be there with just your kids and stuff. So we, we might do something like that too. And I just want to mention, I threw my contact info up here on the screen that if any of you want to ask more questions, I really should have put the Instagram account up there too that Brianna mentioned. Um, we are trying to figure out new ways to get the stories out that maybe would be interesting to non-residents right now that are affiliated with the college. So if any of you want to have ideas about where do you go to get news about Prescott College, where should we be putting this information, just email me and let me know because that's one of the last issues or questions my class is trying to solve. Like, wait, how do we educate around this when we're not there necessarily, or we want to leave behind some information other than just having lots of signs everywhere, which we will do. So um, uh, yeah, please feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or suggestions or, and I did see, um, I think Stevie joined us, who's going to be in my summer class. Um, we are doing a summer block class 
believe it or not, um, it's the only Prescott College summer class that's not fully online. It's going to be a hybrid where um, um, some students will be remote who want to work on small scale ag production uh, projects in their own bioregion, like a farm or community garden, whereas at least half, I think I have five students that will remain resident in either the dorms or the town that will be working every day and continuing these projects um, through uh, June 12th, as well as learning more deeply about the, the ins and outs of small scale production, you know, theory and practice. So um, I welcome, uh, Brianna will be in that class, Steve will be in that class, I have another few um, again, that are already out in different parts of the country getting ready on, on their operations to be sharing their stories from Vermont, Texas, you name it. So um, there's going to be more going on, more developments as, this, as the late spring and summer develops. I put the Instagram for the Garden and Compost Club in the chat if anybody wants Thank to. Thank you, Brianna. Thank uh, you. Can I, can I ask a question real quick? Yes. Yes. Um, I was wondering, um, when you guys have had your like work days and things like that, have community members come out and like seen your garden and have you gotten a lot of feedback from people outside of Prescott College interested in kind of like the mission and vision that you have for these different areas? So far, most of the work sessions because of, again, the coronavirus have been, we've had to maintain uh, small amounts of people in the garden at a time. So it's just been pretty internal, but we have, um, we have a vision for actually getting this, taking this into, like I've talked to a couple of seniors that are wrapping up about to graduate. They go, we'd love to be part of the garden. So we're gonna figure out a way, um, again, Brianna thankfully is in my summer class to make that more clear to people so that they can have that option either to sign up or join us. And whether that's a regular day of the week or we like these sunset work sessions, that's been awesome because it's quite pleasant out there in sunset. Um, but we'll try to get word out about that. And you can always just email me if you do live locally and you wanna get a better sense of that. We just haven't figured it out quite yet, but I think we can do it. And honestly, I just read a story coming out of China where they're re realizing that it's really rare for coronavirus to, to actually be caught, at least in the cases they were looking at in China, being caught outdoors. That it's because of the quality of wind flow and outdoor spaces that very, I think they had one case they documented, two old men walking and talking to each other, walking outside, were a documented case that was caught outdoors. That it was every case, and of course it was winter when all that was going on, was indoor transmission. So all that fresh, clean air, plenty of ble breezes and hot sun. I, I think it's kind of a healthy environment and we will definitely welcome um, participation, uh, especially as we're able to open things up a bit more. Well, I think that uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up now, but I'm so grateful to y'all for being with us today. And um, as often happens in these uh, conversations, I leave inspired and that that's especially the case today. So I'm really grateful to all the good work that, you, that you've been doing uh, on campus. And um, I look forward to seeing how it evolves um, over the summer and into the fall. So uh, we're, we're doing this every week, uh, Wednesday, one o'clock. Next week will be uh, the Resilience Revolutions, a bicycle touring uh, group, uh, Tyler Pastoric and Bella Fern, who uh, were out visiting communities around the country on bi by bicycle this spring, filming encounters with people doing inspiring resilience related work in their own communities. So we'll be talking with them next week at this time. Um, hopefully you found out about this probably through one of the Facebook pages. Uh, we'll continue to uh, advertise these events there. But so good to, to see all of your faces and to hear from you. And Thank you. I wish you the best. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Good to see you guys. <laughs> All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.